For more than two decades, nurses, doctors, and researchers from the University of Saskatchewan have connected with their counterparts in Mozambique. The southern African country faces the Indian Ocean, and if you're going strictly by dollar terms, people in Mozambique are among the poorest on earth. That poverty also makes them some of the most vulnerable, particularly new mothers and their babies. Imagine two planes falling off the sky every day for a whole year. Who are the passengers in these planes? Pregnant women from all over the world about to give birth. Pregnant women. What do you think our governments, our world, those influential people getting together in Davos at their World Economic Forum discussions, what their response might be if this was to actually happen. The thing is that this is actually happening. The statistics are exactly that, about 850 pregnant women dead every day, all year, all over the world. So the question is, what are we doing about it? That's Nazim Muhajirin. He and Jesse Forsyth are among the U of S researchers doing something about it. And they're our guests today on Researchers Under the Scope. I'm your host, Jen Cannell. Today is Tuesday, it's March 16th, and we're connecting virtually today with Jesse Forsyth. Now, she's the director of the Mozambique Canada Maternal Health Project, and we've reached her just outside Inyamban City in Mozambique. She's right next to the Indian Ocean. Hello there, Jesse. Hi, Jen. How are you? I'm doing well, thank you. And I should say, we're also joined by Nazim Muhajirin. He's the principal investigator on this, and he is in Saskatoon. Hi there, Nazim. Hi, Jen. And hi, Jesse. Hi, Nazim. Nazim, I'll start with you. What is it that sets this maternal health project apart from other humanitarian efforts and projects we've seen over the years in Africa? Well, this is not a one-off project. We are not parachuting in for a five-year project and leaving the scene right after. Our project is built on a 20-year continuous relationship with partners in Mozambique. And we are helping train nurses to provide care for pregnant women. So what we're doing is, in a word, everything to make women and girls' lives the bedrock of the families and communities that, that it needs to be. And we have earned the trust and friendship of people and communities that we have partnered with. This is what sets our project apart from many others. And I would just add or maybe emphasize the, that it's really people-centered. And so what sets it apart is like Nazim was saying, the longevity of the relationships and of the work between people in Mozambique and in Canada. So mm -hmm. it's not a project of uh, receiving a sort of blueprint for action that comes from elsewhere. It's one that builds up from what is experienced uh, here. Looking at that, that airplane analogy that Nazim used with more than 800 women a day dying around the planet as they try to give birth. I mean, this that was one of the goals of this project is to reduce that number, at least in Mozambique. Um, and I know, Jesse, the project that you're directing purposefully brought both men and women in about 20 different communities together into these groups so they could identify and prioritize their own health needs. What came out of those meetings? What was most pressing? The really key thing is to ensure that both men and women play leadership roles on the committees and that people are coming from all of the different areas of a, of a given community, so all of the different neighborhoods, as well as all of the different types of leadership within a community, be it health workers, teachers, traditional leaders, political leaders, to ensure that the committee itself has the kind of legitimacy that its community um, recognizes. And really, overwhelmingly, the first thing um, the health committees, the communities tend to identify as a need is a hospital. People always talk about hospitals. What, they, what they're really talking about are, you know, rural health facilities, like the ones that we did build in some places. Uh, but that is always the first thing. In order to be able to respond to really ongoing and 
pernicious, I would say. Um, health difficulties, including malaria, diarrhea, malnutrition, especially amongst children, um, and ensuring that women have safe pregnancies and labors. So the reduction of maternal mortality and neonatal mortality most broadly, but through an improvement, a real strengthening of sexual, reproductive, maternal, and newborn health. Um, in order for that to happen, they, we have bigger problems. We have other problems in addition to a lack of a hospital. Remember, we're talking about communities where people are walking, generally walking, maybe traveling by public transit, but generally walking up to 15 kilometers to a health facility. That includes women who are expecting to deliver and people in sort of critical conditions. Um, and so distance is a problem, but also poor road access is a major problem. And so already when you talk about a hospital, you have to take into consideration a few other a few other factors. Um, but what's really important and what our very, very skilled team sort of engages in in communities is being able to expand a community's sort of reflection and discussion around health needs beyond this sort of very biomedical understanding of health. In order to actually see that a lot of conditions in which they live, in which people live, can be influenced to positively influence health. And here I'm talking about uh, financial insecurity, first of all, especially for women. Um, and really needing sources of income at the community level. Uh, I'm talking about the widespread gender inequality, unfortunately, and the quite difficult barriers that women face um, in being healthy or remaining healthy. Um, and they're really like limited access to formal education, as well as poor treatment at the hands of health workers themselves. So access to health is partially getting to the physical space, but it also includes uh, the difficult interaction upon arrival or at a health facility itself that either keeps people from coming back or simply ensures that people aren't given the treatment that they need in order to get or be healthy when they're there. And so, you know, when people are in communities, especially in early stages of developing health committees in these communities and, and, and reflecting on community needs, the staff of the project are very, very sort of wonderful in making clear what the project wants to achieve, which is to uh, reduce maternal mortality, reduce neonatal mortality, uh, and do so by strengthening sexual reproductive and maternal and, and newborn health, all from a gender equality perspective. Kind of giving women more agency over their lives. Yeah, and I wouldn't necessarily, you know, say that anyone gives agency, but there's certainly the promotion of the respect for, you know, space for women's agency to be enacted, right? To be um, solidified and to be strengthened. Yes, absolutely. And so, you know, talking about how important it is for women to be respected in their communities, in their families, talking about how important it is for women to be heard and, and to be able to make decisions about their own sexual and reproductive health. And when I say decisions, I mean things as um, important, but perhaps seemingly basic, perhaps, as questions about whether to have children, when to have children, how many children to have. These are not givens in the context in which we're, we're working or, or discussing right now. Um, and so one community, very early in the development process of the health committee, immediately spoke of the really important, difficult problem of gender-based violence, of domestic violence, right? And of, of women in particular and young girls needing um, protection and them as a health committee needing ways into that, ways into teaching, um, ways into preventing violence and just talking about it. It's very different. Violence anywhere, probably in the world, is a difficult thing to talk about. Mm. Um, but it was remarkable that... Go, that this one community discussion started with identifying the need for a hospital and then shifted by the end of an hour, an hour and a half, two hours into, into the problem of violence and violence against women and wanting to ensure that young people have access to good education, good 
sort of sources of information through their own schools on violence. Um, but another response that's been really important uh, going back to the problem of financial insecurity is to develop micro projects, what we call micro projects. So in each of our 20 partner communities, there is at least one small income generating project. Um, they range from flour grinders right now to chicken and egg production to latrina production. Um, and all of these are, are super key. First, providing spaces for women's leadership and having women um, respected in their roles of coordinating teams, but also it, they generate income. They generate income for the people um, working on the projects. They generate bits of income for the health committee that the, that the committee then decides how to use. But then they also, in their function, you know, improve nutrition. They improve sanitation. Um, and in the case of the flower grinders, they really reduce the amount of physical labor that women are most often asked to bear. What were women doing before the flower grinders? Uh, well, physically pounding corn, grain, physically pounding, you know, using a sort of large, almost a meter long mallet, almost pounding into, um, you know, a vessel that would go up to waste. Like a giant mortar and pestle system? <laughs> yes, exactly. Thank you. That's a good image. Oh. <laughs> um, heavy. Uh, repetitive, ongoing, and needed multiple times, you know, a week, if not a day, in order to sustain, you know, the food production for either a family or, you know, a smaller family or extended family. So this is a, this, this, this signifies a significant shift in women's role in, you know, just food production um, at this level. Now, you talked about how effectively you've created a lot of community buy-in by making sure community members and women and men sat on these health committees. You're effectively changing a health culture in Mozambique. This is what it looks like from the outside. And I know that we have promised our listeners there is some good news here. It's not just backbreaking labor and 15 kilometer walks to get to the hospital. What's improved because of this project? Um, you know, the things we take for granted in Saskatoon, for example, picking up a phone or making an online booking to see a doctor, getting ourselves to the facility, or even to have a facility in the first place close by to visit. So these are things that are not as common in, in the communities we work in, uh, in Mozambique. So what we did was we proceeded to build uh, facilities in seven different sites. We built five maternal clinics. So these are facilities that provide in-person care for pregnant women and newborns and children. We built three maternal waiting homes. So these are facilities usually next to a maternal clinic where mothers who are ready to deliver may come and stay or a day or two rest before they deliver their babies. And all of our buildings came with solar panels for power as a power source and boreholes or deep well for running water and equipment and amenities. So, you know, this is really a big deal for communities and a country in which these structures are really lacking. What is really notable here, though, is that all of these buildings happen during the pandemic year. So last year, from March to October, the construction it finished on time. Once we got started in March, it finished on time and it came under budget. So <laughs> how many times can we say that? And so COVID effectively meant that you got a lot of construction work done. Jesse, Jesse, what's that been like for you watching these open? Oh, really? I can't even think of an adjective. It's really phenomenal. It's kind of overwhelming. Um, so much of what we do requires long-term vision in terms of seeing the impact, but the building process w went remarkably smoothly and we saw ground being broken and we saw 
uh, facilities up in use within a year. So it, it's just, it's very heartwarming. It's very, very emotional. And, you know, I want to go back just briefly to something you said, Jen, which was about the project helping change no notions of health in Mozambique. In fact, the notions of health that we're working with and working through are not international or Canadian, and they're not from outside of Mozambique. They're very much from within Mozambican sort of health ethos, policy, protocol, programming, et cetera. The priority on health promotion and the pro promoting of rural primary health is a, is a Mozambican priority. It's, I think it's the gender dynamics, though, that you raised, you know, having some decision-making power over when you would like to have children rather than just sort of going with whatever happens or not having that say in it. Uh, same with the financial insecurity that women have and even just the, the physical labor that they go through just to make flour in a day. Uh, the gender dynamics, that does feel like, is that Mozambican women pushing this? Yes, very much. But it's difficult. Like change is difficult. Uh, however, I mean, again, like Mozambican policy ever since the liberation movement has been about promoting gender equality is actually enshrined in the constitution. So with newborn health, emergency newborn health, there's a need for updated practical training in responding effectively to newborn emergencies. This is because where you have one one nurse who isn't a pediatric nurse, right? Not trained as a pediatric nurse, but we'll have to respond to a uh, newborn in distress and we'll have to know how to do that confidently. And so um, in the past sort of 18 months, we've started doing on-site practical training. That means going into hospitals, going into rural health posts, going into the places where nurses primarily are working and working alongside them to practice, 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 practice using mannequins, right? Using a whole process of simulation practice responding to a baby in distress. And what's happened as a result of that is we've been hearing, you know, oh, I can do this. They're feeling better about it, right? And they're feeling, they're feeling that they can. And any hopes that you have for the future of this project? So, you know, one lesson uh, that I think COVID-19 has taught us is the interdependence of all people, you know, uh, either for good or bad. So I think it is um, it is same for our project between ourselves and uh, people we partner with in Mozambique. You know, what I really hope is that our, our work in Mozambique, uh, even during this unprecedented year, uh, will be seen as a turning point for women and girls and families. And um, my hope is that, you know, there will be no need to use a metaphor of those jets falling uh, off the sky to make our point, you know, of 850 women uh, losing their lives uh, every year. And my hope is that those children who were born this past year will have a better life than even their siblings. Uh, because their families and communities worked with us to make it so. So those are my hopes going forward. Well, thank you, Nazim, and thank you, Jesse. Uh, best of luck to both of you with all the work you're doing on this. Thanks thank you. Much, Jen. Jesse Forsyth is the director of the Mozambique Canada Maternal Health Project. Nazim Muhajirin is the principal investigator. Now, to find out more, go to maternalhealthmozcan.ca. So that's all one word: maternalhealthmozcan.ca. Researchers Under the Scope is a presentation of the Office of the Vice Dean of Research at the University of Saskatchewan's College of Medicine. This podcast was recorded and produced on Treaty 6 territory, and we acknowledge that we live and work on Treaty 6 territory, which is also the homeland of the Métis. We pay our respects to the First Nations and Métis ancestors of this place and reaffirm our relationship with one another. Hey, thanks for tuning in today. I'm Jen Cannell, and once every two weeks, we put out a new episode of Researchers Under the Scope, 
Go ahead and stay in the loop. Subscribe today.